are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's video is about the unsolved mystery of the Father's Day bank murders. And this involves an unsolved heist as well as a murder scene. And there is z almost zero evidence remaining in this case, but so many questions. By the way, I post so much content in June and July for Suspect Summer. And so if you were interested in true crime content, hearing about these stories, then subscribe down below. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 1991 in Denver, Colorado, and there stood the United Bank Tower. There would be a robbery, but it would turn into so much more than that. It's the Sunday of Father's Day that year, and on 17th Avenue and Lincoln Street, alarms would start sounding at around 5.04 a.m. The guard on duty shut them off and didn't really do anything with it. There was nobody called, and it was just almost like they were shut off in the attempt to silence them and then they went back to work. These alarms went off in the basement storage center and then the records in the control center showed that they were just turned off. So that's basically all we know about what happened at 5.04 a.m. but it could lead to what would happen next. We're just not sure if these two things were connected. Four hours later at 9.14, a man named Bob Bardwell, who was the bank's vice president, requested to go into the bank through the side fright elevator. This was requested through the street level security phone that was connected to the bank's guard room. So of course they were going to pick up because that seemed like a legitimate phone to use and they gladly accepted it from the vice president of the bank. And so a wonderful soul, 33 year old guard, William McCullen Jr. decided to head down the elevator to greet the vice president to make sure that he got where he needed to safely and he headed on down but unfortunately he would soon find out that this was an imposter. The doors would open to the elevator. He would be shoved back inside by this imposter and they would go to the sub-basement level. There, William was taken off the elevator and shot three times in the head, one in the torso and one in the arm and left in the storage room. This killer then stole William's electronic pass card and key, picked up the five shell casings from the floor, and then decided to head through the bank tunnels. This killer decided to head up one level, which was where the guard room and the vault were. And during this time, he actually tripped an alarm that was in the stairwell at 920, but this didn't stop them at all. And in fact, they just continued on. This killer continued to the guard room where he came across two unarmed guards. There was a 41 year old Philip Mankoff and a 21 year old Scotty McCarthy, and they were forced into a battery room where they were also shot dead. When they were found, Mankoff's body was kind of over McCarthy's, like they were trying to fight off this killer before they were ultimately shot and killed. That's when a third unarmed guard walked into the guard room and saw what was going on and was faced with this killer. He was 21 year old Todd Wilson and it's unknown if he heard the shots and was coming to try to help or if he just walked in blindly and was then shot to death as well. It was only feet from this battery room where the two other guards were killed. 18 shots in total had been fired and only one missed its mark. At this point, this intruder, this killer, went around tampering with evidence, trying to collect evidence to hide his identity, obviously. He ended up with 10 videotapes, bank keys, a two-way radio, pages of the guard logbook, and by 9.48, this killer was at the vault door and it was opening. Six employees were inside processing the cash deliveries that they needed to get done and so they were ultimately all told to cover their eyes and lie on the floor all except the senior vault manager David Barranco who was told to fill up a satchel with two hundred thousand dollars 
He did so and then all of the employees were ushered into a man trap which was like a small room in the actual bank of vault which has two interlocking doors so the first one would have to be locked before the first one would open and which basically meant that they were trapped inside. And so at 9.56 this killer was escaping with this bag full of cash and he was also picking up all of the shell casings off the floor before leaving. Now, it took 20 minutes for the employees in the man trap to actually get out using a spoon found at the door to pry their way out. By the time they got out and saw what had happened, there was the only evidence remaining was the 18 bullets fired, but none of the six employees inside the vault were actually harmed at all, not even like a scratch. They were all, of course, scared to death, but none of them had been physically harmed. So thankfully, they were all okay, unlike the unfortunate souls of the four guards. But thankfully, because there were survivors, there were witnesses. And so these employees gave their statements to investigators as to what this person looked like. And they said it was a male who appeared to be in his late 50s or 60s. And he was wearing a gray sports coat, a white shirt, a multicolored necktie. He was also wearing blue or gray slacks, a brown fedora hat, mirrored sunglasses, and had a bandage on his left cheek. When investigators got there, they found that a Colt Trooper gun was used at the scene, but then they found something that was even more strange in their eyes. You see, the killer hadn't taken a huge amount from the actual vault. In fact, it wasn't even an amount that could fill up the actual satchel that they had. It wasn't even the full 200,000. It was like $197,080. Over 40 FBI agents and two dozen detectives worked on this case, and they found so many things that they were questioning. Like, why were the guards immediately killed, but these six people inside the vault were left unharmed completely? And the amount of money just didn't make sense with there being two million dollars he could have stole from this actual vault. Now the biggest theories throughout this whole case was that this was someone who had previously or did work at this bank or that they were possibly a police officer due to the amount of rounds used because 18 rounds was the standard load carried by police officers which was a fully loaded revolver and two speed loaders. That's when they began to investigate current employees of the bank as well as former ones and that's when they came across who they believed could be their man. It was a man named James King and he was a former Denver police officer and you guessed it, he also worked at this bank. It was between 1989 and 1990, a year before this robbery took place, that he worked at the bank. James was also in a lot of debt. He even had declared bankruptcy a few years prior and was $25,000 in credit card debt. He was arrested July 4th, 1991, and it was found that he had at one point owned the same weapon used at this crime scene, but had said that he had got rid of it because it was defective. But bank employees who had seen this killer had picked him from a police lineup. The trial began on May 19th of 1992, and it was hugely publicized. It was actually on a huge cable network called Court TV at the time, and five out of the six employees were to pick him out of the lineup. But it was the second time that they were asked to do so. The second time, police decided to draw sunglasses and a hat over these people in the lineup's faces to make sure that it matched the person at the actual crime scene. And at that point, James King was picked out from five of the six employees. James was also said to, strangely enough, shave his mustache, which he didn't really do right after this crime had occurred and when investigators asked him about this he said that he had a sore lip and the mustache irritated it so he shaved it. He also bought a larger safe deposit box right afterwards. He also told police for an alibi that he went to the Capital Community Center to do a chess game with the Denver Chess Club. So they went to this community center and they asked around and nobody could really say that they had seen him that day and also the Denver Chess Club hadn't had a game there 
in years. The bullets were also tested and found to be from five manufacturer brands, which is so strange for one gun to be to have different brands of bullets inside, but it isn't unusual for police because they go into these bullet buckets which contain a whole bunch of different brands and they load up there. But there was no physical evidence saying that James was the killer and the robber. And he also had nothing in the safety deposit box that he had just gotten. And employees at the bank said that James had not been working there when the man trap was installed in the vault. He had already long gone. And so he wouldn't really know that it was there, that it worked unless he just saw it when he got there and told him to get in it. A neighbor of James actually came forward to testify for him saying that she had seen him that day mowing his lawn and even said happy Father's Day to him. The jury deliberated for 53 hours before coming back with his verdict, which was not guilty. But this did not stop the FBI from watching him basically for the rest of his life because they wanted to see if they could get anything on him to charge him with that wouldn't go into double jeopardy, which is when you cannot try a person for the same crime twice. And so they were trying to get him on anything that didn't necessarily involve these murders. James lived at 665 Juniper Street in Golden, Colorado, and pretty much lived there as a hermit for the rest of his life, probably due to the fact that he was being watched all the time. But he did die of dementia on May 21st, 2013 at 77 years old. And they had nothing on him at that point. But there was another man named Davy Calvin Baker who had actually confessed to reporters to being the robber. But when he was brought in and investigated, he of course recanted his statement and said he did and actually do it. There was also another suspect called Paul Yukum who had been tried and acquitted for stealing $30,000 from a United Bank ATM the year prior to this robbery, so in 1990. Paul had lived less than a mile from the bank that was robbed in 1991 and when investigators went to look into his apartment, they found a closet that was secured by handcuffs. Inside, they found boxes of 38 caliber and 351 caliber ammunition, as well as a police scanner, speed loaders, police batons, replicas of badges and dummy grenades. And Paul didn't have an alibi for what he was doing the day of the murders at all. But obviously they went to James instead, and I'm not sure that Paul was ever really further looked into. Now, something that really stood out to me about this case was that the guard logbook was taken. And as we know, the alarms went off at 5.04 a.m. and they were mysteriously just shut off and nobody really even talked about them, which in a bank you'd think if alarms go off at any point, even in the morning, you wanna investigate because that usually means something's going to go wrong later on, which it did. And so to me, this almost seems like the guard working at 5.04 was possibly in on it and wanted to cover the tracks. Maybe that was the person who had robbed the bank later on. I don't know. I don't really know who was working that shift. It was if it was the same one working later on when the bank was robbed and then killed. I'm not really sure about those details. I could find very little information online, but it's just something that I thought about while researching. And also the change between aggressively killing these guards and then just leaving the employees safe and letting them go into a man trap. I mean, he only needed the one to put the money in his satchel, so why didn't he kill them? I mean, of course, I'm thankful that there wasn't more of a massacre than there already was, but it just makes you wonder why. Did he possibly work there and work with the guards and know their protocol and know that they would try to fight him off if he continued and didn't kill them? Or did he possibly work with the employees in the bank vault and like them, maybe they were the same employees that this person worked with and didn't want to necessarily, necessarily kill them as well? I mean, I just think that that's very strange to leave them completely fine when you're going to just up and kill the four guards who were unarmed, by the way. That's one of the main things in this whole case. These guards were completely unarmed. They weren't, they couldn't have shot at him even if they wanted to. Do you think James did it 
or do you think he was possibly framed or possibly police in general? I mean, I think the whole Paul Yukum thing, having all of that police gear in his closet, makes you think, could this robber and killer have used certain things that he knew a police officer would use to impl implement a police officer so nobody would look for a regular citizen? I mean, I think that that would be a pretty dang good cover-up to use. But I just don't know about this case. It's baffling and I wanted to bring it to you because of course today's Father's Day. So I hope you enjoyed it, but it's just, it's heartbreaking to me that those guards had to lose their lives over this. I mean, the entire vault wasn't even taken. There was two million and they went for less than 200,000. I mean, did they need something specific that was 200,000? I don't know, bank heists have always been my favorite. From when I was little, um, the movie Catch That Kid is my absolute favorite. And so for some reason, I feel very attached to bank cases. So when this was also a murder case, I knew that I wanted to tell you guys about it. So if you want me to do any others, then leave them down below and I'd love to do those for you. But don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there and bye!